Evening everybody. I have gone a minute early because I want to use every minute I can with Kate because we've only got a short session together. But I am completely actually quite nervous because I'm so fangirl. <laughs> and you're there. <laughs> oh, it's magic every time. Aww. Do you know your book? I'm actually quite nervous because... 30 years later as a therapist, your book is so meaningful and important and beautiful. And there were so many things I wanted to jump up and down and shout that I agreed with. <laughs> oh, that's so touching. I like looking at your work. There are just so many things I wish I knew when I started about what, what people like me want to say, what kinds of comfort that you offer. So I'm just really looking forward to this time together. Me too. I mean, can I introduce you first? So you're an author of many books, but this is the the book that really uh, touched me and moved me and, and is so, it's such an important book. But you're also a professor and a podcaster <laughs> and a mother of one and a wife. And do you want to sort of tell, because from uh, maybe you we're being followed by or joined by your followers but my followers may not know the precursor of this book what what led you to write this very important book oh sure i um i'm a historian and i mostly study cultural scripts religious cultural scripts around how people explain the sort of easy cliches of um you know that everything happens for a reason or that, uh, that we can have our best lives now. And I, so I wrote these kind of really dense historical <laughs> books about that. And then I was very suddenly diagnosed with uh, stage four colon cancer when I was 35. And it, uh, it took my life apart. I was, did. I was suddenly did. very lonely and very, I felt like I just kind of exiled to the, where the outside. sad people go. Like you were outside. Yeah, yeah. And Looking part of on, the, everyone else was like having their best fucking lives. <laughs> and you, gosh, yeah. you were with these awful doctors. <laughs> yeah, I really, I, got, I never, I, I know there are many wonderful doctors out there. Of course. I, I have not met them in my experience. <laughs> so, Those just... blunt instruments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I love doctors. I, work in, I worked in the NHS for 25 years. And I taught Breaking Bad News, actually, for like 20 years to medical students. Oh. But I have never seen such terrible practice <laughs> as I saw in your book. Um, I mean, we could, ha we could do a whole five-hour webinar on how awful that is. Uh, I can, want, can I, I just say, I'm interrupting you, the <laughs> outrage. Doctors, I mean, all the research shows doctors think they break bad news better than their patients receive it. But yours, they didn't even break bad news. They <laughs> smashed things. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. Oh my gosh, I wish I knew you a million years ago. I, yeah, I, I was like, is this normal that I, that I have to, uh, I have to ask, hey guys, sorry, no one has explained my diagnosis. Um, oh, hey, would you mind letting me know if I'm going to live? I'm not really sure what this means. Or, um, hey, I know you just said I had a new tumor uh, and you're sending me to radiation. Do you mind if we, uh, it, it actually looks like that might be a medical error. Do you mind helping me understand? There's a bit of like, it has been a rough road. So when people feel, um, start to feel worthless, in a system that doesn't always recognize our humanity. I think that's what makes me feel so cracked open to other people is uh, I think it's so, our lives are just made of such delicate material. <laughs> yeah. But also when you're given a life threatening and a life limiting diagnosis, you are hugely fragile. As you say, it cracked you open. And, you know, you needed sensitivity, not someone kind of drawing a, a biological um, picture on a piece of paper or leaving the room or, you know, and also being in a clinical trial, recognizing it afterwards that you were a study participant and not a patient. So you become objectified when you kind of lost yourself yeah. anyway. Yeah. And you need, and there are fantastic doctors. I am not, you know, I, I, 
I've worked, you know, I really know there are. But what I felt with you was that you weren't attuned to at all. You weren't seen as a person. And that made what was already devastatingly yeah. difficult and complex so much worse because you didn't feel safe. You didn't feel safe in your body. Yeah. And then you didn't feel safe with the people who were meant to be treating you and yeah. getting you to a safer place if possible. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was all very surreal because I'm a historian at Duke University and I was trying to get treatment at Duke University Hospital. So I would like have a blazer on and then I'd walk down a hallway and then change into a hospital gown. And all of a sudden I, I found it was so hard to be understood as, uh, but yeah, you just, you feel like you're, you're like lost in a translation that, uh, that doesn't keep the core elements of who you are, I guess, because the most of us in our lives are, are, are never really asking just the basic, like what is going to happen. All we're just trying to ask usually is, um, what do you think it means? Like, how do you think I can put this information in the context of like being a mom and having a toddler? Do you know if I can, like, how should I manage my expectations of the world? I, I, I always find that I'm not really ever asking for certainty. I'm just asking for someone to kind of come alongside in the meaning making yeah. process of grief. Yes. And kind of work alongside you in a kind of supportive, compassionate way so that you can ask difficult questions and, and you may not have answers, but you can look at them together so that you feel heard and that you matter. Yeah. And the, the other, I mean, there are so many aspects of your book, but um, this thing that you started when you talked about um, the sort of cliches of everything happens for a reason and, you know, how it's people's discomfort with facing mortality and, and that there is no cure for being human is what motivates them. But do you want to kind of describe what that meant for you, what your experience of that was? Someone, yeah. by the way, told me to stop talking and let you talk. So I... No. I love it. I want it so much. And this is all this conversation has already brings me so much joy. I, uh, yeah, I think we have these little bits of well-worn advice that we're handed. And I mean, I come from the history of religion world. So I know the religious ones, uh, intuitively God is always needing an angel doors are always closing and windows are always opening. Um, uh, there's never uh, a setback. There's always a setup. God never gives you more than you can handle. That one. Um, that's the. Oh. Uh, just, I think the um, and that, so th those were a lot of the sort of cliches that I was studying when I was, especially trying to understand cancer as a crisis. But um, as I kept living, which was a real shock to me, I was. Uh, Thank God I started... you did, Kate. <laughs> Thank God you are. <laughs> Big time. I, I just I realized that if life is a chronic condition we have chronic health chronic lives like that there's really also a whole set of advice that we're given to always make the most of our lives and from you know just be present to only live once to um you know do what you love carpe diem, yeah. carpe diem so many diems so much carping I uh I think in all of it, it was uh, a way for me to intellectually and kind of emotionally get inside of the experience of urgency and uh, that we have to live, but also the, the really um, overly simplistic math that we hand people who are suffering as if, we're, as if we all have the bandwidth to take every one of our, our minutes and transform them into moments. And it's a lot of pressure to make, to render all of life meaningful when mostly you're just trying to survive. And breathe, and but 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 also it feels in some way, I mean not intentionally, but sort of diminishing because it so does not acknowledge or allow the enormous fear and pain of your experience. It's sort of saying, listen, just put that to one side yes. because God has a better plan. Just, yeah. You know, don't make a fuss because whatever. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I mean, I, uh, 
I'm a Christian. I, I teach a lot. Most of the people I teach are going to be these adorable do-gooding pastors. And I mean, even I find the promise of heaven to be, um, I mean, a little disappointing, frankly. I mean, I'm still, I'm <laughs> You'd still, rather hoping, be here. <laughs> still hoping for now. So I, I guess the, the idea that any of our lives are going to be good math when, I mean, almost all the good and lovely things are terrible math. Love, what bad math? I mean, we just... The risky it's, business. Exactly. Life exactly. is a risky business. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing, the message that came so strongly through, and I think particularly in American culture, but American culture spreads through the world. And I think it is here as well, but maybe the volume's a bit, a bit louder in America, is that, you know, we can solve everything, live your best life, and that you can overcome stuff. And that somehow accepting our mortality or allowing for our mortality yeah. um, and that bad things happen and we suffer is a sort of failure. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, the, the area I particularly specialize in um, is when children die. So when a, a parents are told that their child has a terminal diagnosis, there is nothing anybody can say that in any way is going to make that okay. It is yeah. random. It is, you know, it is death out of time. It turns your whole belief system and what you trust in upside down. And at that moment, you are completely shattered. Yeah. And it's random. It's completely random. Yeah. And yet people somehow want to do, like you're talking about the maths, of, they want to make sense of things rather than, as you talk about, making meaning or knowing that you can suffer and have moments of joy and love and be loved and that love is the strongest medicine. Yeah. But also, I know this person who's watching really wants me to shut up, <laughs> that when you're the one who has a diagnosis or your child is ill, when you walk towards the people who you most want to walk towards you, they tend to turn away because you remind them Yes. of their mortality yes yeah yes i you said all so that i'm just repeating no it. julia i i i i i'm i ran into um a, a friend's mom the other day and uh and you know we all have the casual way that we encounter one another but i can always tell when someone has lost too much and she uh she just said um you look so well. And the way she said it and her eyes are just bright with tears. Like she lost a, a, an adult child that should not have, that to cancer that should not have died. And like, yeah. and, and then, and if we're both sick at the same time and she sees me, there is all she can see is a world that has really no good order to it. And um, oh, nice I feel, sense. I just feel, I feel that so acutely, the um, unfairness of it. And also, um, that it, uh, it, it's trying not to rob from anybody, you know? Like my, my survival does not uh, increase her grief, but we kind of, we're all sort of hitting the same note. And just yeah. to be able to, I, I just appreciate that honesty. So just to take a minute to be able to lean in and to, for her to see mirrored back that like, that I know that she's a mom yeah. and, um, and will always be a mom. I just, that is the kind of intimacy that all of this, creates and uh, yeah. none of it is easy and the acknowledgement i can feel as you're feeling it the acknowledgement of the truth of that yeah. is both agony and connecting yes it's both torturous and there's something that you can share that yeah. you don't feel less when you leave you feel yeah um, met in some yes way. absolutely yeah and i know people can't always live in the deep end i really do know that I just, there's a sense you get when you know someone's not afraid of the past that you bring and the uncertainty that you create just by having, you know, our dumb, uncertain yeah. lives. And the, 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 the thing that particularly, obviously, not obviously, but it particularly touched me was that I had a daughter that was very sick at one point and you talked about your wonderful mum and it's going to make me, me cry. My daughter would say that I exuded so, mum, you're exuding. <laughs> and it's that dance with, as an adult mother who loves your child like they're your baby, but also has to let your adult child 
be in charge of their life and I can't go in and talk to her nursery school teacher. I have to let her make her choices and have her suffering and I can't fix that. Um, it's impossible. It's impossible. I mean, I, I, that's the, the feel, I think that was when I was trying to think of how to describe my mom, I said, uh, like, this is a bird. This is the burden of a mother's love, how it hovers without landing. Yes. That is exactly like the, what you said. That feeling. And I feel her humming, uh, because I, they, I, I am unfixable and love it's, 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 it's absolutely intolerable. To, to have a love that cannot fix. And I know that that is uh, such- And you know it as a mom. I mean, I, it really has changed what I imagined parenting was because I did imagine it was as a fixer and as a shield and as a deflector. And then when you are the one that is bringing pain and uncertainty into your home by the sheer force of your experience, I- uh, I just, I have to imagine that, that the magic of love is that we, um, is that we, we are, we just show each other the way, these tiny little steps of doing impossible things, but, and then going to bed early, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, just, it's the small just, stuff and the moments, isn't it? It's like, you know, giving each other a hug when you just, the words just don't do it. And also showing up with lasagna, you know, because you know that you're knackered from chemo or whatever it is, or yes. or a new pair of pajamas. Sometimes it's it's pragmatic things. Are the when you're faced with something so enormous and and in the face of it is so unbearable. Sometimes a pair of nice pajamas does the business, right? Oh my gosh, it is absolutely mostly about pajamas. Even though one time <laughs> recently in Alaska, Christmas, my sister said the most devastating thing to my mom, who picks out these beautiful, luxurious pajamas, that hers <laughs> came in the wrong color and they looked absolutely bananas. My sister held them up to her body and she goes, oh, look what happened to me. It was the <laughs> meanest thing anyone's ever said about a present and I, I wept. I, and my mom, of course, is just um, just right there with the plate of cookies. And I, uh, yeah. it's these small, ridiculous things that make us uh, known, make us love each other, and make us not be sort of desperate to turn away and then can't just out of and, wanting and to bear And they knit each you life. together despite the despair, don't they? They hold you, they hold the threads yeah. together, those little yeah. acts of love and kindness. Yeah. But also your humor. Is that through all of you? Is your I mean Aww. your humor is is so <laughs> and funny though. I mean it's so Aww. kind of startling and funny. Thank and it, is that your parents? Is that your sister or all of do you, all of you have that? <laughs> I think we're all a little evil. I mean my parents <laughs> uh they their power went out in their house and yesterday and I texted to see if they were okay cuz we're from the middle of Canada where it gets very cold. And I was like, dad, are you okay? And all he wrote back was, no one's in an iron lung over here, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> such, a, such a funny thing to say. So I, I don't know. Well, I, I, and also what made him think of it? I mean, iron lung. I, Nobody's <laughs> had iron lungs for 70 years. <laughs> I, I think that, um, that the surrealness of tragedy and humor really hit at that tragic comedy place. And it's always been a very productive time for me. The worse things get, the more, the more I dig deep. But also it enables you to survive the unbearable too, you know, because yeah. you just, sometimes you just have to, yeah. dark yeah. humor, you know, yeah. black humor. There is a wonderful book uh, called Deep Survival about um, people's, you know, people who land on aircraft carriers and people who, and, oh, yeah. uh, it was a what he had this wonderful way of describing um like dark truth telling as a way this sort of our brains uh, i pictured it as brains keep from overheating uh in which we can practice saying true things but i think that has been the great joy of having conversations like these it's just that we all need practice saying the hard things out loud because i mean after i was diagnosed for a long time i was a, just a wonderful consummate liar i mean i was always fine i looked like a reality show star about someone who's very, very excited about their cancer. <laughs> so. did, did you know that um, fine in a therapy world, do you know how it's defined? No, tell me. Fucked up, insecure, neurotic and emotional. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. <laughs> That's what you were. 
<laughs> that checks out. <laughs> that, 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 sounds, that sounds exactly right. Yes, I do. Um, do you have a, in your work in befores and afters, do you have, um, I imagine it has, has given you a kind of posture toward people that you could also recognize in others. Do you, what do you think it is about um, the way that you walk into a room with people who are living through the unbearable that helps you be there and stay there in the right way? Gosh, that's a good question. I think it's that I step in with, I guess, acknowledging the agony of this and humility and my intention to be beside them in it, that I can't, I can't make this better. And, but I really, I kind of witness with them and then ask them to tell me, I don't, my main thing is I'm a really good listener. Like, tell me yeah. what is going on. You know, what is hurting most now? Or what is your biggest worry? Not, as in, what is, not as in, what's the worry on your mind? And mm -hmm. being heard, people feel different. It's beautiful. But it's, it's not a magician. Yeah. It's, it's a basic skill that we all have and we kind of can forget to use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well bless you for not taking the exit ramp it is the most tempting thing in the face of an impossible pain to be somewhere else but you know I I always um was frightened you know for 25 years I worked in an NHS hospital um supporting families where children and babies died and I never felt okay about it I never mm -hmm. found it D yeah. easy it was always difficult but it was also incredible you know there were moments of real joy and connecting and humanity and mm -hmm. love in the end is the strong medicine and you say that in your book love is in the end allows you to st you what do you talk about it love is so terrible um and life is so beautiful and they don't cancel each other out yeah. and that you can hold both um, is a difficult thing to juggle, but the only way that we can survive these terrible things. Yeah. Yes. That, yeah. Yes, that is right. It's so funny. I. Uh, <laughs> it's like the cause and the cure. It's so funny because I, I remember I was asked recently in the pandemic to... Um, Which to might have made everything cancer. worse for everybody. Yes. I, I was asked to do a, a, a thing for a parenting magazine and um, I was like, oh yeah, it's our loves that drowned us. And, um, and she's like, oh, do you mean, do you mean save us? Or, and I was like, oh no, no, I mean like it's the sheer weight of all these loves. You know, it's caring for elderly parents and, you know, kids with precarious uh, health and learning disabilities and, and just regular everyday uh, meals. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's our loves that are sometimes what, uh, that what our lives struggle to bear up the weight, but it's also, it is also all the magic. And they're like, oh, we don't, we don't, we don't like that very much. <laughs> and, and we just, yes. And I think that we just have this romantic view of what love is and love is so, it is, it is, it is glitter and it is gritty and it is, and it is the only Agony. thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and where you, you where you love most, you hate most. Where you love most, you fear and lose most. But also, it's the only thing that it matters. But it's, it, it, you know, having it's it's a it's it's an impossible thing. And it, I think how it's described is this, as you say, glittery sweet, kind of fluffy thing. And it's a hard thing. You know, it's a tough thing. And it's like people talk about soft skills or communication skills are soft skills. Love is not a soft skill. Love is a fucking, you know, it's, it's like, a, I don't think, what are those tanks? It's like a tank that needs big wheels and it's lots of protection, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. 
<laughs> yeah, I really like how dark that got. I totally agree. <laughs> I think it is it is terrifying to behold that much love. And I, I think we, um, I mean, I, I know that it is often the thing I want to skip when I have tried hard to protect the people around me from yeah. the unsolvable okay. nature of my life. Yes. Yeah. And, and yet none of it is, um, none of it works because, um, because we belong to each other, unfortunately. Yeah. And also when people do try and protect each other, they build walls that create gaps where you lose stuff. Yeah. And you, yeah. do, you can't afford to lose stuff when you're no, going through you what you're going through. No, we're losing too much already. Just all of us, all the time. We just can't afford those. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I adore you. This has been such a well, joy. Again. You're so scary in a fun way. And I'm just really <laughs> invested in your brain. Thank you. <laughs> well, I hope we all talk again. I've got your quote. This lovely man in, in this unfinished, was it a church? We're never done, dear, even when we're done. <laughs> it's our lovely unfinished and unfinishable lives. I think yeah. it's, Yeah. I always thought I would come to a sense of peace about that. And I think finitude is just, um, it is okay that we have ends without endings sometimes, as long as there is so much love in the meantime. And it's not a tidy business. It's a very messy business. <laughs> Do you want to move Glory. here and make my life easier? I could bring you to all my appointments. Okay, I think, I'll come. I, think, <laughs> I would love that. But you've got all those girlfriends that love you and your sister. They, they are scary. I was recently hospitalized for something. And I think my cat, my oh. friend Catherine came in the hospital being like, do we have enough pillows? <laughs> like that was her opening line. And she was right. We, we were missing a lot of pillows. Yeah. Well, Kate, I hope, I hope your survival continues every possible day. Thank and thank you so much for talking to me. And I do hope we talk again. I, I feel sure that we will. Thank you so much. What and to remind everybody, to, if you want your life changed and your heart expanded and to laugh, Aww. you read her book. It's an amazing, <laughs> amazing book. Um, so thank you, my dear. What thank a you. pleasure. Thank you. You too. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.